Uh, so my name is Luke Barnes, I'm an astronomer at the University of Sydney and my new book, uh, written with Geraint Lewis, who's uh, also an astronomer at the University of Sydney, is called A Fortunate Universe, Life in a Finely Tuned Cosmos. Fine tuning is a word from, from all of physics really. It, it means that your, your ideas about how a certain system, a certain part of the universe works, have a suspicious assumption in there at some point. So, uh, so a, a simple example might be if uh, you think that the, the way that the robber got into the safe was by, by just guessing the code to the safe, and it's a 12-digit code perhaps. Um, your, your, that, that idea to explain how the robber got in would mean to make the suspicious assumption that they just managed to guess the code right without, without any extra help. So in that case, um, you're suspicious of that idea. So we've applied that kind of idea to... Uh, well, physicists have applied that kind of idea to their models about the universe and particularly to our place in the universe uh, and have found that actually small changes in the way we think the universe works if we take uh, uh, parameters, things like how much electrons weigh and how fast the universe expands, if we make small changes to those, these seem like fine-tuned suspicious assumptions that if you make small changes, the universe doesn't seem to work, doesn't seem to produce life as, as we know it or even as we can imagine. Fine-tuning could be a coincidence, perhaps at the end of the day something unlikely has happened and that's all that needs to be said about it. There's plenty of things in life where, where something unlikely has happened but there's nothing else to say. But if you look at a scenario and either intuitively or, or in physics you do a calculation and it appears to be improbable, there seems to be a very low probability in there at some point, it's a chance to go and look over the assumptions you've made in producing that low probability and, and say, okay, Maybe one of those assumptions is wrong. Maybe we made a, a, a wrong assumption about how the universe works. So it could be a coincidence, a coincidence here just meaning that the universe has its properties and it just produces life and there's nothing else to be said about it. Um, but it's, it's an excuse, I think, to look a bit deeper. Maybe this, the laws of this universe aren't the ultimate laws of the universe. Maybe this universe we know that we can see isn't all of the universe. Maybe there's more. Maybe there's principles uh, deeper than the laws of physics as we know them. Um, maybe deeper than the ultimate laws of physics that we should think about as to see whether we can get a better explanation. The anthropic principle has a slightly long and confusing history. Uh, the way I think of it, and the way I think most astronomers think of it, is in terms of a selection effect. So if you're an astronomer, this is a very familiar thing. Um, if you do a, a survey of, say, the distant universe, you're looking for galaxies, it would be great if you could just sort of wander around the universe with your clipboard, surveying all the galaxies you can find, but you can't. You're stuck here on Earth, and the only things you're able to see in your survey are the things that are bright enough for you to detect them, because you can't see things that are too faint. So, if a galaxy is too faint, you just won't see it. And so there's a selection effect there. The further away you look, the brighter something has to be to see it. That's a selection effect. There's a difference between the population of galaxies in the universe and the sample of galaxies that you have. So I think of the anthropic principle as similar to that. It's, it's a selection effect that we are observers and so we have to find ourselves in conditions, cosmic conditions, conditions of, of, of the underlying physics that permit the existence of observers. Now that by itself doesn't explain anything in, the, in that no selection effect really explains anything without a population there. So if we ask why, why is that galaxy out there very, very bright, the answer is not because otherwise we wouldn't see it. We need, we need to understand galaxies. But if you have a population, you can say why in this sample that I've drawn from the population, why is it that things that are further away seem to be on average brighter? Well, it's because we couldn't see anything that was faint out there. So, perhaps, if, if the anthropic principle is going to do some work for us, perhaps there's other parts of the universe which have different conditions. This is called the multiverse idea. In which case, the, the anthropic principle would be a selection effect. Why do we observe a, one of the particularly seemingly rare parts of the multiverse which would support life? Well, it's because we're observers and you need to create observers before you have a universe which kind of observes itself, so to speak.
Some people think it, it does. So in the, the classic illustration of, of why we would think that nature points to a designer, you think of, of William Paley, uh, who said, I, I'm, I'm walking across a, a heath and I kick a rock, and I think, you know, there's a rock, but I kick a watch, and I think, oh, well, you know, this watch, it has various pieces that seem to be put together for a certain purpose, for a certain end. Um, it's not that nature couldn't produce something like this, but it's a better explanation to say that someone wanted to tell the time. Um, so if that's uh, an idea that appeals to you, the idea that the universe as a whole has pieces that fit together in a very intricate way in order to produce the necessary conditions for life, uh, that, will, that will obviously slot into your idea that this universe was set up by a, a being who thought that life was a good idea for some reason. Uh, the, I think the most compelling reason on that um, in, in that region is, uh, is that, uh, that if you think of, of God as the good or something like you know, Plato saying you know, that, that God is the good, then a universe with moral value is the most important thing. Making it big or beautiful is secondary to making it good and having you know, good creatures in it. So uh, chapter 8 of the book explores these. We have a conversation, so um, we, we have a back and forth about what we, what we think fine-tuning might possibly mean. And the, 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 the chapter is really an invitation for you to have your own conversation with you, get some friends around and some good beer and have a chat. So, um, Geraint, I, I try to defend the idea, Geraint critiques it, and you can decide for yourself whether you think that it's a convincing idea. Is fine-tuning testable uh, is a in very interesting question. Fine-tuning is a part of theoretical physics. So whenever you have a model, you have to explore all of its consequences. So you, I mean, every model you write down an equation on a sheet of paper, what you're really saying is, you know, I think the universe might be like this. Let's consider some, some consequences of my idea. And if you find that your model is fine-tuned in a certain way, of course, you know, relative to its assumptions, you have a a reason to suspect those assumptions, to look closer at those particular things that you've assumed. So, for example, that there is a free parameter, that it has a certain value, all of these sorts of things. Maybe you should go looking for something a, a deeper, but it, it focuses your attention. So it's that part of the whole scientific story. The entire scientific story is you take your theoretical ideas and you go and look at the universe and see if you were right. I made that sound easy, but we have to build great big particle accelerators and telescopes to do that. But I see fine-tuning as, as part of the scientific uh, endeavour. It's the theoretical side of things. Let's explore our ideas about the universe. Um, and in particular, fine-tuning for the future of physics is, I think, a clue to something deeper. It's as successful as our ideas about the universe have been, and they have been fantastically successful from particle physics from the bottom up and cosmology, really, from the biggest scales. Fine-tuning says let's keep looking deeper and it directs our attention to these, particularly these parameters, which we can go out and measure, there's no problem with that, but the fine-tuning says this is a suspicious assumption, let's look deeper. So if you're looking at uh, what other views there are out there, uh, scientists tend to be sort of sceptical at looking beyond science. So Martin Rees wrote a very good book on fine-tuning, uh, I guess 17 or 18 years ago now, uh, called Just Six Numbers, um, in which he considers uh, the multiverse really is his uh, preferred answer at the end of the day. He sort of brushes aside any ideas beyond physics of a designer of that in about a paragraph and says, if, if you don't find that satisfying, let's go and look at the multiverse. Um, but a lot's happened since then. I think a lot of the cases are fine-tuning because it's theoretical physics. Our, our methods have improved. Computations have improved. We've looked a lot harder at those, and I think those, those problems are still very much there and in many cases stronger. Um, and there's a lot more to be said about the multiverse. We've Physics and, and cosmology have looked a lot harder at. Can we make this idea work? Uh, can we think of a way of generating these other universes in a way that might leave an imprint on our universe or at least follow naturally from how we think the universe works. Paul Davis in his book on fine-tuning considers again a range of options 
and thinks that the most likely is what he calls a biophilic principle, that there's some principle underlying the universe, which, as the name suggests, uh, prefers life or likes life or wants to point towards life. So that's a, an example of something that would be a physical principle, but it would be over and above the laws of nature as we know them, sort of directing the numbers in those laws to, to, to make life in some way or another. Um, it's, a, it's a vague idea. Uh, it's, it's hard to see how that would be played out. You would need something like a definition of life to be fundamental, more fundamental than physics as we know it, which uh, if, if he can uh, explain exactly how that works, then we'd all be very interested. But that's the sort of interesting ideas that come out of this sort of, uh, this field of fine tuning. It's a clue, as I suggested, we can't stay here. We have to go looking for deeper answers. And that's one possible answer.